So about, about 15 years ago, I read a program called TreeView. And it was a simple program to display evolutionary trees on Macs and PCs. And I guess I wrote it because I wanted a simple tool just to grab a tree and show it. There are a few programs around at that time, like Phyloth and NJplot, that I thought were a little bit too clunky. There were programs like PALF and McClay, which definitely weren't clunky, but did too much. They, you needed data. I just wanted to grab a tree and show it. Now, it made a lot of sense to write a program way back then. I don't think it makes much sense to write a program today, <clears throat> because the last thing the world needs is yet another biology viewer. There's just a swarm of programs available. So pretty much any platform, Mac, PC, Linux, the web, there's a program with a cute icon for you. And not only are there lots of different programs, lots of these programs are written in just about every language that you can imagine. So you can have LaTeX versions, Flash, JavaScript, Java, whatever. So <clears throat> my sense is that when you've got a lot of different tools that are solving essentially the same problem, then the field is basically mature. The problem basically has been solved, in which case I can say, thanks very much. Uh, save my voice and ask any questions. Now, I know it's Friday afternoon, and probably finishing this talk right now would be really a godsend almost. I feel, I feel compelled to continue. And I want to give you a, a very personal perspective on where I think viewing phylogenies is going. And I want to start with <laughs> this. Fundamentally, trees suck. And they suck in particular. I want to give you a comparison with a visualization I think works really, really well. And trees suck in ways that, for example, maps don't. So I want to go through some of the advantages that maps have, and pretty much everything that's nice about a map, phylogenies don't have. So maps are basically very predictable. So, oh god. So if I show you that, it looks pretty shocking. It's probably even more shocking. But you probably get, vaguely get a sense, actually, really, it's that. And the fact that you can look at a map and realize there's an up and a down, even though it's entirely arbitrary, it's a convention that we all more or less adopt. So maps are predictable in how they look. Navigation within a map is highly predictable. So <clears throat> this is Boston, and there's the Broad Institute just there. If you're looking at that map, and pretty much independent of most map viewing software, or indeed most projections, if you go to the right at any resolution, you'll eventually encounter large amounts of the Atlantic Ocean. It is, it'll always happen. You can predict that. So navigation within that map, you always know, I'm going to the right, I'm going east, I will hit, hit the sea sooner or later. Within a map, pretty much every pixel counts. So despite the fact that the color's gone AWOL, the color of the pixels in that map all tell you something. Am I water? Am I land? Am I a road? Am I a park? And of course, if we switch to satellite view, then literally every pixel has information. And of course, we can do you know, really quite detailed analyses of landscape by looking at the colors on those pixels. So it's incredibly dense, incredibly rich kind of information. We also have this really nice thing that, that ground truth. Even though the map is an abstraction, we can kind of figure out that it does sort of map reality in some way. So if I start at this point and I zoom in a bit closer, and eventually we can get something <coughs> like some imagery, and then this is looking pretty much like where we should be, and I go down the street view, and yep, and I can go outside and pretty much see that kind of view. So even though each of these views is in some sense an abstraction that's constructed, it sort of has some sort of matching to reality. We can sort of ground truth it. Within a map, there are two kinds of ways we can navigate, basically. Uh, one way is what I'm going to call relative navigation. And this is the idea that, say, if we're down here at the Broad Institute, and I want to go to Starbucks to get some coffee, I can give you directions in the terms of you know, get inside the building, go right, go right, go right, there you are. And that's sort of navigation with respect to those landmarks. Now, we can do that in biology. For example, if I say, I've got a new DNA sequence for a species, I kind of use the same idea. I find, OK, what sequence is most similar to the sequence that tells me where it goes in the tree? What I don't have is something like this. So completely independent of that map, I can get the latitude and the longitude of Starbucks, and I can stick it on any map I care to name. And that, of course, has led to the whole kind of explosion of geotagging and georeferencing tools and, and Facebook places and all that kind of thing. And we don't have any of that in phylogenies. So basically, all those kind of great attributes of Predictable navigation, high density of information, and navigation with this kind of coordinate system we just don't have. So what we do have are diagrams like this. And one of the problems with trees is it's not always obvious what x and y represent. 
So this particular tree here, there's a lot of ambiguity. I can sort of muck around on this axis and this axis and come up with quite different diagrams that are still fundamentally the same thing. So for example, I can reorder the names of these uh, species, say, over here. This is still exactly the same tree. All I've done is I've flipped A and B around and C and D around. That's still the same tree. So the order on the y-axis is fairly arbitrary. If you want a physical demonstration of this, the mobile that we've got sitting out in the DNA atrium, it's moving slowly around. Now, as a tree, just looking at it from left to right, it's constantly changing. As a phylogeny, it never changes. And so the order from left to right of those animals hanging down means absolutely nothing. What matters is the order of those connections. So we can fiddle around in the y-axis to our heart's content, and the tree's still the same. Then along here on the x-axis, this is essentially just a partial order, by which I mean what it matters is that A and B group together before the base of the tree, and C and D group together before the base of the tree, but I have no information about the relative order of this with respect to that. So I can do this, that's the same tree in evolutionary terms, just if I've just got that information about grouping. I can try and improve things somewhat by saying, okay, let's say, that x is evolutionary distance. Problem there is, what do I mean by that? That distance can vary depending on the method of analysis I knew, use, or indeed the gene that I use. Probably the best candidate for some sort of really sort of concrete objective axis along here would be time. Time is great. The problem is it's quite hard to measure. And if you just read the literature, there's enormous controversy trying to put dates on the evolutionary age of different kinds of groups. So we have a situation that there's a lot of ambiguity in this direction and quite a bit of ambiguity in that direction. And so I find it quite stunning, really, that people would want to introduce a third dimension into these kind of things. So one, one sort of common technique to display phylogenies is to say, let's do it in 3D. And it seems to me, we're not totally sure what this is. Lots of slop here. Let's add this. And so we get visualizations like this. This is one called Palo Verde. It's, it's really quite pretty. It comes out of Mike Sanderson's lab in Arizona. But you can see, basically, it's just a 2D view of a tree, and you sort of fly through it. So it's not making a huge use of 3D. Now, that's quite pretty. We can throw more money at the problem and come up with something like this. This is the Wellcome Trust, who released um, this is quite a gorgeous-looking flash animation, which you can interact with, of the Tree of Life. And you can sort of click on these nodes and get some information. But again, it's fundamentally, it's a 2D plane, and we're sort of flying through it. So the 3D is just sort of adding a kind of you know, fly-through effect going on here. And again, we've still got essentially just a 2D tree. And we can go, if you like, full 3D with something like the Walrus browser. This is a hyperbolic browser. And it's very, very pretty. But I'd argue, OK, it's pretty, but it doesn't seem to be terribly useful. They're really hard to navigate. So I guess we could ask, in this context, is 3D useful? Now, I think there are a couple of cases when 3D can actually be quite useful in displaying trees. One is nothing particularly to do with trees, but just if we have some sense of multiple layers you want to separate, it can be quite useful to do this. This is uh, it's a cover for an issue of systematic biology that I was involved in creating. And there was a paper on this issue that was dealing with gene trees. And one of the kind of big realizations, I guess, in the last decade in phylogenies is in the good old days, we'd get one gene We'd sequence it, we'd build a tree for that gene, and that would be the tree for the species. It was job done. What we now discover is that every gene in the genome can have its own individual history, and the species tree is some sort of aggregate of those individual histories. And I wanted to capture that by saying, these are these different trees for the genes, and the species tree is this kind of cloud-like thing down here. I feel like it's the sum of all the shadows cast by those individual gene trees. So I wanted to kind of separate out the multiple kind of gene trees embedded within the species tree. And those of you who know about the systematic, history of systematics, this is kind of a homage to Wayne Madison's paper from the late 90s about gene trees as and species trees as being clouds. So we could kind of do something like this. We might have species along here. This is some measure of evolutionary distance. Or perhaps this is some function, different kind of genes we've got. And I've done this exactly like this, just to show you this visualization here. This is by um, Kim and Lee. It's trying to show you the evolutionary history of a single gene family. And in this case, we've got gene duplication. So some of these genes have copied several times. So what they wanted to do was display the evolutionary history of a gene related to the species. And these are the multi-copies. And you can sort of spin it around and have a look at the, how many copies have I got of these genes in those particular species. 
So that's one use of 3D, just to try and sort of tease apart these gene trees. I guess the other one that's, that's probably the most sort of successful in a way is taking phylogenies and putting them on some sort of geographic map. And I guess the two people most associated with this, we've seen uh, David Kidd had a poster here last night, and Andrew Hill is another one who does this. So now we make the X and the Y axis longitude and latitude, and the Z axis becomes, for example, evolutionary distance. And so what we can do is things like this. So I was playing with this idea a few years ago and was very proud of myself because I got these little lines to curve on Google Earth, which turned out to be fairly important. This is a phylogeny for a group of salamanders. They're mainly in North America. There's some down here in Central America, one species over there in Europe. And you can kind of lay this tree on to Google Earth and play with it. It gets a bit messy when you start to zoom in. You get this kind of really kind of tangled effect. But I guess the nice idea is you could lay, you can imagine laying multiple phylogenies for different groups of organisms in the same coordinate space and have a look at what's going on. One more version of this, this might be a little hard to see given the thinness of the lines, but this is a Google Earth animation using a phylogeny where we're tracking the evolutionary history and dispersal of avian flu virus. This is something Andrew Hill did. We have lots of sort of sequences bumming around here and then suddenly they whiz around and go into Europe and down here into Southeast Asia. So you can kind of combine time with geography in a kind of time-lapse series and, and use 3D in that particular context. So that's, that's 3D. I wanted to look at, I guess, a couple of other things that I find quite interesting. One is the idea of reaching out and touching the tree. And there have been a couple of really kind of cool projects where people have been exploring how you can interact with phylogenies using touch. This is one project, and specifically the goal of this project was to uh, encourage collaboration. Often people are trying to compare the same kind of tree or interact with them, are these trees different? And you can interact with them around this particular table. This is quite cool. This is um, another version of the same idea. This is um, a company called Perceptive Pixel who released a video showing this kind of great kind of video wall and we're looking at the tree of life and whizzing through it. And I blogged about this when it came out and Kevin Zelnio, I've sort of got a little quote of his up there, wrote that he thought this would be really, really cool, particularly in museums. So if you had one of these sort of big walls at about, I guess, this height, kind of four-year-old height, you can imagine kids coming up and just sort of interactively zooming through that kind of environment. Now, I think, you know, having a kind of video wall like that would be really, really cool, but of course, What's really changed, and one thing that's kind of actually in many ways really surprised me about this meeting is until probably the last sort of few talks, I haven't really talked about this. And I think this is going to be a huge game changer. And it's a game changer for two reasons. One is it moves from you know, having you know, very expensive flash tablet for flash kind of displays to this, to the fact that pretty much everybody is going to have one of these, either an iPad or a touch sensitive phone. The other thing this gives us is not only the fact that people have these devices, but it gives us a common sort of vocabulary for interacting with them. So Apple have basically decided this is how we're going to touch these things. These are the kind of gestures to make things big, to make things small, and interact with them. So not only do we have these physical devices, we have a kind of consistent language for interacting with them. And so things like this, this is a tool called Dendroscope. And it's a tool designed to look at very, very big trees by distorting the kind of space. So you have a kind of fisheye lens effect going up and down the tree. Now, I'm not a huge fan of that particular way of visualizing things, but it strikes me that the biggest problem with this is the way you have to interact with it with a mouse. So you have to kind of define a rectangle on the screen, you have to define the magnification you're gonna put, and you sort of drag it around. This seems to me it's crying out to be put on something like an iPad where instead of all this mucking around with drawing rectangles, you just touch it and zoom in and play with a tree. So I think if anybody wants to um, sort of have a really big impact fairly quickly on the way we visualize trees, port something like Dendroscope or Tree Juxtaposer to this thing, and, and the field will thank you for it. The final topic I wanted to look at is, I guess, the perennial favorite, the problem of big trees. And to give you an example of this, in 2003, in science, there was a whole issue devoted to the tree of life. And they decided what we really need to do in this issue is show people the tree of life. And here it is, it's got faded by our wonderful projector. But this is the tree diagram, and here it had about 3,000 species. 
And when they printed this in the journal, the advice to viewing this was it really needed to be printed out on something like 1.5 meters of paper before you could see it. And this is a tiny tree. I mean, 3,000 species is nothing. There's probably at least nearly 2 million described species, probably another order of magnitude more waiting to be formally named. Now, that's not a terribly great visualization, um, but some people have taken this advice fairly literally. And so Mike Sanderson has built this wonderful kind of wall of monitors to try and show the tree on a much bigger kind of scale. Now, again, the tree that's being shown there has maybe four or 5,000 species in it. And if you imagine we're trying to see trees that are, you know, have millions of species in them, we're going to have to have, you know, extend this way around out here and out here and out here before we get close to being able to see the whole tree. And again, it seems remarkably wasteful. I mean, we had this wonderful phrase um, from Tamara Munson's talk about pixels being precious. And this seems extraordinarily wasteful that there's just this tiny little bit of text and sort of a few lines. And, and most of what you can see on that is just empty space on those monitors. And it strikes me as kind of really odd that, you know, we can fit the whole world effectively on an iPhone with Google Maps. You more or less have access to the entire planet in your hand. And so it seems to me this kind of way of visualizing very large things is possibly more appropriate than, than doing that, even though that looks still really way cool and I would kill to have one of those kind of things. So I guess I've been interested in, could we use that kind of approach to navigate through really, really big trees? And the, the basic idea underlying Google Maps is this kind of idea of image tiling, which we've seen several times today. It's the idea that we have an image like this and we break it into a series of tiles and bigger tiles like that. And at any one point in time, you're just viewing a very few number of these tiles on your device, but they may be zooming in quite a lot or zooming out. So the demands it makes on your, your display are actually really kind of small, even though potentially you're browsing a very large image space. Now, this is going to be, oh, it does appear. This is a, a quick little test I did using a little tool called Zoomify. So I thought, I will take a big picture. You can't see it sort of disappeared up here of a frog tree and put it into an image tile viewer and browse it. And let's just try and do that again. So there are two things that, about this that didn't work. The first is this tree is really long and thin and we're sort of expanding it this way and that way, which doesn't seem terribly efficient. The other thing is you can only ever see the labels, like what are these actual species, by the time you've zoomed in really down to the fine kind of details. So we need some way of I guess not ex expanding it this way, just expanding it that way, because that's any relevant dimension. And I guess in the same way that Google Maps, as you zoom down, you get layers. You might start out with, say, continents, and then countries, and then cities. We want the same kind of thing for these taxa. So I've been fooling around with various attempts to do this. And this is one that's a little bit kind of clunky. This is uh, the GenBank Taxonomy for Frogs. And it's basically, you can zoom in way down to the tips, and all the labels, despite this projector, are readable. These are the species. These are different groups, often genera. You can whiz through. You can zoom out again and browse the whole tree. It's essentially using exactly the same kind of tiling method as Google Maps, except we're expanding it vertically, the only kind of dimension that matters in this context. And the label is always legible. And what I'm hoping is that something like this, you can scale up to the entire NCBI tree, effectively the tree of life. It's, not, you know, it's only a couple of orders of magnitude bigger. Now, there's, there's one aspect of this tree diagram that, that I sort of omitted in a way. So we have the kind of x-axis, which is just sort of some sort of taxonomic hierarchy here. The ordering of these things is essentially arbitrary. And despite the fact that genome browsers have got quite a lot of bad press in this meeting in some ways, I would kill for a genome browser for trees. So what, one thing I'd really, really like to do is to be able to have over here the kind of same kind of tracks that we have in genome browsers. But to have a track, say, that says, OK, how much DNA we sequence from each of those frogs? So we get a, a quick sense of you know, which ones are the genome projects, which ones aren't. Could we get things like, um, I don't know, body size going down here, genome size, all that kind of information. And in order to do that, it would be nice to have a kind of consistent ordering of these things. In particular, it would be nice to have a fairly kind of stable, consistent order, ordering, because this tree changes over time. As we sequence small species, this tree will grow. And so you could imagine if somebody comes back and looks at this tree, say, a couple of months down the road, there'll be more frogs there. And it's quite possible that entire tree could change dramatically if I don't sort of impose some kind of consistent ordering. 
And if you go back to Google Maps a couple of months later, you don't expect Africa to suddenly have switched over to the other side of the Americas. You expect it to be fairly kind of constant. And it seems to me there's probably one very simple way, kind of trivial way we could do this. And it relies on the fact that in the context of, say, the GenBank taxonomy, every time somebody sequences a new species, it gets a number from GenBank. I guess a little integer, and that integer always goes up over time. So you could imagine that if we had a tree like this, and if we always said the rule was, okay, the smaller the number in a group, the higher up the tree you go. So in this case, one is smaller than either two or three, one's at the top. In this case here, two is, is smaller than three, two goes at the top. Now if I add any new species, they're gonna have a higher number than one, two, or three, and I stick them in, in these sort of garish colors here, so Four species would go up there, for example, and the fifth one would go up there. Now the tree would grow, so it would be different, but the relative positions between these guys would remain essentially the same. So you can imagine, if you go back to the tree, you always get mammals, say, up here in this part of the tree, and plants down here, and so that there might be new mammals within the mammal group and new plants within the plant group, but it wouldn't be the case that they spin completely around in the same way that the mobile does out in the atrium. So it's entirely arbitrary but I guess in the same way that north is always up is entirely arbitrary. I guess if we had some sort of stable convention, then we could use, I guess, something a bit like this as our equivalent of a, of a genome browser. We could browse the whole phylogeny that we have and try and associate information with that diagram. So that's been a, a whirlwind tour of phylogenies. So I think the three kind of things that I find most interesting at the moment are the geophylogeny stuff, taking georeferenced phylogenies and putting them on tools like Google Earth. I think there's enormous vacancy for somebody to come up with a nice visualizer that works on touch devices. And I think the task of being able to display very large trees, and in particular, not just individual trees that people have, say, from a particular alignment, but the complete tree, the complete tree of life, is something that our field is desperately lacking. If you want uh, to find out any more about my rants and raves about these various kind of topics, I have a blog which discusses most of these kind of ideas, and most of the videos that I've shown you, particularly this kind of very crude demos that I've assembled, you'll see uh, on that blog. If you um, want to find out the sources for some of those uh, visualizations that I showed, even the ones I sort of poo pooed a bit, I'll put my slides up in SlideShare, and each one of those slides will have a URL to the particular visualization that I've been talking about. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much for your time.